good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can we talk about Gem and the Holograms? Yes, welcome back, faithful listener, or, you know, new listener. I'm not sure why you'd start at episode 6, if you're, I don't know, unless you're the kind of person that watches in, like, reverse chronological order, and this was the newest episode at the time, or, like, if you threw a dart at a board with numbers on it, and, I don't know, isn't that just a dartboard at that point, Kristen? Yeah, I'm pretty sure dartboards just have numbers, that's that's how the game of darts works. That is how the game of darts works. Well, in any case, welcome to Swatash. I'm the swa, or the dart, of this board, and I'm Joe. You are too many things. I'm just Kristen. You are just Kristen. I'm a, I'm Dart Swa. That'll be my nickname from now on. It's uh, horrible and it doesn't roll off the tongue at all. So it's, yeah, it's a bad nickname and I'm not going to use it. So. All right, cool. So I'm just Joe. And uh, yeah, this is a podcast where we look back and uh, you know dig up the past of this horrendous, horrible, amazing, awesome cartoon, uh, 80s air quotes classic, Gem and the Holograms. We are experiencing Gem and the Holograms via Shout Factory's Gem and the Holograms truly outrageous complete series box complete set. But, uh, you know, you at home, if you want to join along, it is available on Netflix and other such video services that may or may not actually have Gem. Just, uh, you know, or just pretend you're watching it. You know, be on the subway and uh, pretend you're laughing at pizzazz punching somebody. Don't laugh at things on the subway. Someone will look at you weird. Well, that's why I suggested it. So if you're going to be staring at your phone on the subway, not doing anything, you may as well laugh at it. If you're going to be on the subway, you have to be weird. <laughs> that sounds right. That's how I've experienced it in my life. It checks out. It checks out. It's it's pretty good. That'll go over great. It'll be I, perfect subway behavior. I uh, take back my objection. And uh, this week we are starting the massive three-part spectacular entitled Starbright, which is apparently the name of the movie that they signed the contract to. Did they, you know, mention that anywhere? Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that, because at some point I just saw the word Starbright on the banner or something, but I saw it in the <laughs> episode title, and I was like, I don't, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, and I mean, this one also has a subtitle called Falling Star, which I guess, you know, that's going to mean, since this this, epi- this series is a little literal with how it does stuff, so I'm going to assume Falling Star means, you know, everybody's fallen down, especially Bonnie, because we learned some, we learned a pretty big revelation about Bonnie that we've talked about a million times, so it's not really much of a revelation. Yeah, it turns out her eyes just pop right out of her head. <laughs> she falls over, and they fall out, and, uh, you know... It's we'll, really we'll... graphic for a children's cartoon. <laughs> we'll go over that within the, uh, within the show itself, but, uh, alright, I think we're gonna throw up the theme song here. No use wasting any time. There's a lot of shit going on in this episode, so here we go. Theme song. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, so the very first sentence spoken in the episode recap is, Jerrica Benton, disguised by a hologram, is the glamorous rock star gem, which sounds like a drunk person wrote it. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, I mean, it's very exposition heavy. It's, you know, I, I think that obviously since I also is... don't think that explains it properly. No, it doesn't, because they don't mention synergy <laughs> at all. It's no. just disguised by a hologram. I know how you were, I think you were saying last episode how they needed to be very specific about synergy because a lot of people might be confused as to what exactly is going on with Jerrica, but they refuse to like mention that synergy is a thing in this thing. Yeah. Like she shows up in the episode. So like, hopefully that was enough, but considering this is, is the like start of the actual series after the five uh, first parts that, you know, they were originally writing and like set out to make. Um, I think they could have done a little bit of a better job with the exposition. Yeah, probably. And, uh, I mean, it says all of the important stuff, like they, they won a battle of the bands. They made sure to mention six months ago, so we were correct there, uh-huh. that it was indeed six months. And, I was uh, saying, uh, this recap is going at a million miles an hour. Well, you gotta think, they gotta stuff the last five episodes into two seconds. So again, they don't mention Kimber's Rebellion or anything, or the, nope. the Disaster Boat. Nope. Just uh, that Howard Sands, the guy who won them the contract, uh, movie, movie, movie star mustache man, movie mansion mustache man. Who yep, I forgot it. the name of, Howard Sands, uh, is throwing a party for them, which I guess is a pre-production party? I, I guess, or a You Beat the Misfits party? Also, yeah. the person doing this recap doesn't sound like Jerrica again. It sounds like Shayna. No, I, I don't know who's doing the recap. I don't even think it sounds like Shayna. I don't know who it I, is. 
Again, I think it sounds like shit without a I'm voice acting voice going on. <laughs> so it's just somebody talking normally because they needed mm-hmm. to add it in like really quickly. But yeah, they're they're having a party at uh, Starlight Mansion. Yeah, the banner does say like congratulations, Gem and the Holograms. And that was another question I wanted to ask. Like, I know Howard Sands owned this mansion, but he gave it to the holograms in the second episode. So Howard Sands is throwing this party in their house, basically. Yes. Uh, why not? Why, yeah, it's why a mansion. There's I room. guess, yeah. It's there's there's a lot of room available. Nobody's really you know bumping into each other or anything because the the orphans are all off doing their own shit. Yeah, immediately as soon as we start the thing, Jerrica is telling orphans to do stuff. <laughs> Orphan labor at the top of the episode. Like Orphan, you think we're joking when we Orphan say that labor they make the orphans work to stay in the mansion? Yeah, well, it's it's a party, Kristen. Somebody's got to do it, and literally nobody else. All know, the adults is in this are getting mansion. smashed and yeah, eating caviar. Exactly. Yes, of course. So we're already getting into, like, at the party here, this thing that shows up several times throughout the series of Jerrica's, you know, walking around and somebody goes, hey, uh, where's Jem? And Jerrica goes, oh, uh, I'll go get her. And then runs into a room, changes into Jem, and comes out. And then very soon afterwards, somebody goes, where's Jerrica? Yep. And she has to run and change back into Jerrica. She's living her double life. It's so hard to be a famous rock star. Um, so yeah, she runs off to change into Jem in a room without a door. <laughs> Just the first thing I noticed. Uh, I think it's the Countess grabs them first because she needs to uh, put on her Jem fashion clothing, I believe. Yeah, they uh, didn't decide to get changed and ready for the party until the party had started. <laughs> Not only that, but the Countess brought the entire Gem and the Holograms summer line or whatever to this party just so they could wear, just so they could choose, I guess. Yeah, sure, why not? And apparently all of the um, outfits are the perfect sizes for all of the holograms, <laughs> or apparently, like, have models measurements. Sure. They don't have they a, got you long know, legs. They don't have a tailor who's coming in here just, you know, making sure to make the amendments immediately as they put on the clothing. Oh, if they are, the Countess is doing it herself. Really? And, uh, you know, we get Kimber throwing her catchphrase around, which I believe is now set in that her catchphrase is outrageous. You know, exclaiming outrageous at the sight of clothing. Yeah, that's what I do, so... <laughs> And uh, they all come back out in their in their countess designed clothing, and Rio has a very <clears throat> creepy line. She says uh, a lot of creepy shit in this episode. Like, a right lot near the beginning. A lot of people say a lot of creepy shit in this episode. That's also to be true. fair. Uh, yeah. yeah, Rio comes over and he just goes straight up to Jim and goes, "Ooh, you look so hot. You'll melt the cameras." Mm-hmm. Rio, this woman isn't your girlfriend. No. Um, and then she needs to uh, go away because I think it's the kitchen wench we decided, like the old lady at Starlight House who like just disappears sometimes. The only other adult, she just is gone after a while. Yeah, um, I think I think she ha- she has a lot of lines in this episode too. This might be the most she's ever interacted with anyone in the series thus far. Yeah, um, she needs Jericho, so Jem's gonna go get her. And uh, as she is leaving after Rio's uh, red hot pickup line, he goes, "But Jem," and uh, the correct response to that is Rio, stop. <laughs> also, uh, one thing we learned that from Jericho's dialogue that Rio gets to be in the movie too. Yeah. I. Why? Uh, mm, he's <laughs> purple stubble. He's yeah. He's gonna rack that Gross purple stubble. Purple man. What? what? What possible role does he have? I guess other than than guy number two, since we learn later that uh, Nick there's Man a, is, like a love triangle is thing the going. leading man. Cause, yeah, because there is a leading man. Rio's just around. Rio's just schlumpy. a guy. Do they think Rio has like the good looks to be? Do you think Howard Sands was like, I need another guy in this movie, and he sees that that beautiful purple hair, and he's like, I got him. No, I don't think that's what happened at all. <laughs> You're probably right. It probably is not what happened. But uh, anyway, Jerrica has to go check on um, a little orphan named Bonnie, who we've only seen a couple of times before. Um, And it's funny because uh, the kitchen wench old lady, starlight lady, uh, is expressing her concern about Bonnie's eyes. And uh, the way that they introduce us to this is that um, Bonnie is watching TV in one of the other rooms. Apparently she is exempt from orphan labor. (laughs) Um... And she is sitting like a foot away from the TV. Her face might as well be pressed right up against it. Yeah, when um, you're and, I, well, when you're blind, Kristen, why would you need to do orphan labor? See, it's funny because at first I was like, I don't remember how we get introduced to this plot line. Are they implying that Bonnie has been sitting too close to the TV and that's why she's blind? Yeah, no, that's my question too, is when she's introduced and she's watching the TV very closely, I assume that Kitchen Wench is just kind of like, she's been sitting really close to the TV. I think her eyes are going to get completely fucked even though it's probably more like i noticed bunny has been sitting a lot closer to the tv i think her eyes might be getting fucked Mm -hmm. and uh, oh one thing i wanted to mention so jem put on the countess's 
gem on the hologram's clothing and then changed back into Jerrica and it disappeared. Was that clothing a hologram? Like, what happened? Um, I think that was, um, a continuity error. <laughs> because, um, when she needs to, so she's Jerrica right now when she needs to turn back into gem for something. So instead of doing that, she goes to see Synergy through the invisible wall. Correct. And so she's, like, just trying to make sure that the supercomputer is getting too tired making one hologram. And uh, Synergy is like, no, of course not. I've been getting physical. I'm all pumped up. <laughs> um, I believe what then... she explains is that she can make 600 holograms in a second without even wasting any energy. So I believe that also puts another stake in the fact that Synergy can destroy the world if she wanted to. Yeah, and she'd, like, start... Jerrica, like, rubs up on synergy a little bit and i said stop caressing the computer that's your mom uh yeah i said uh the computer is getting head pets from jerrica that's creepy um but yeah she gets turned into gem as she's leaving again and as she is leaving she has her regular default gem outfit on and in the next scene she has the countess's dress on again oh really i didn't even notice that okay uh -huh. One I, of the... I went back to make sure <laughs> one other thing i wanted to mention is uh when they're in that scene where they're talking about bonnie uh, Jerrica, for some reason, the line read that she gives, she really forces out the word ophthalmologist. I didn't notice that. Like, she's just like, oh no, we're gonna have to take Bonnie to the ophthalmologist. I think uh, her voice actress has, this was not her best performance in this episode. There were a couple of things that I was like, excuse me? Do you wanna, <laughs> do you wanna try that again? Well, no, they gotta make these episodes fast, Kristen, come on. Well, one, yeah. One I take. Know. That's of why course. they call her one take Jerrica. And uh, in the very next scene, we are introduced to one of the weirdest characters in the series, perhaps, uh, Video Montgomery. Do you only say that Vivian because... Vivian Montgomery. Do you only mean that because she's dressed horrendously? Well, first of all, she's the weirdest makeup in the series because she has, like, the old TV color bars as makeup. I don't, does she? I didn't even notice that. That's what they look like. Oh I don't know God. if they are, like, exactly meant to represent that, but that's what I always assumed they were. She's also wearing this, like... Frumpy looking, brown, weirdly designed. Was it, was, yeah, it, like, was, it, was it a dress or was it a sweater? I don't even remember. It just looks I, terrible. I, I have the note that says video. What is that fire jacket? <laughs> it's like a weird brown jacket with like orange and red triangles all over it. And it looks really bad. Yeah, well, video looks really bad, I think. As well as, I think just part of it is also, the, yeah, the, the makeup on like the edge of her eyes, which just isn't a good look. No, she, she's, uh, whenever she shows up, she's always just kind of like incidentally there. They try to make her into way more of a character than she actually has substance for. Yeah, pretty much. She's only, so, she's, the, the, the most we see out of her is probably in this episode where, well, one, she's Anthony Julian's friend as well, which is how she is introduced because Anthony Julian is hanging out with Shayna, which mm -hmm. another point to, to that, that they're sort of a couple, I guess. I guess. And, uh, yeah, video is just she wants to make a documentary about the movie, so that's how they shoehorn her into the episode, I guess, as a means to introduce Clash, I think, is really the only yep. reason. And, like, let's be honest, Clash is the more important one here, so... Clash is we... much more important, and also mislabeled in a toy commercial as the fourth misfit. Yep, so we'll talk about her a little bit more, uh, later. And, uh, yeah, another orphan is calling for Jerrica, so Jerrica, as Jem, walks over, and she's like, oh, hey, uh, Chrissy, or whoever, what's going on? And she's like, oh, Jem. <laughs> kind of wanted Jerrica and then I'm yeah gonna... I was gonna I was gonna say that like <laughs> what like Jem couldn't like she couldn't just be like well I'll help you for now yeah she didn't that... have to do an awkward oops I accidentally messed up yeah do you think that the orphans don't trust Jem is the thing uh well if they're orphans they probably have trust issues with their parents dying or leaving and all well and you gotta assume Jerrica's not around for them very much so you know nope and, yeah, um, uh, Jem hides in a coat rack. Yeah, yeah to change to, back to... into Jerrica. <laughs> Would not even like she's kind of like halfway out of it too. Yeah, like, like kind of leaning out of the coat rack. Like the all of the locations that she chooses to go back and forth changing in in this episode, they look like the kind of places where in another episode someone would see her. Like, in, in the few instances throughout the entire series where she is caught, it's in safer situations than these. <laughs> yeah, she's really, like, just wantonly changing, just reckless all over the place. Wherever wherever yeah. she can find an empty room without the thought that anybody could pass by and be like, oh, what the fuck? Yeah, well, she's busy. Gotta make sure you uh, keep that orphan labor going. So, yeah, they go into, I guess, the kitchen where the orphans are preparing food in the kitchen. <laughs> Um, and yeah, it turns they out they're the out of ice. That? They're out of ice, but everyone's busy. Yeah, and uh, but then who cares? Because Rio comes in and he's like, "You don't need to help the orphans; they could take care of themselves." Yeah, Rio literally is like, "They can handle it. Don't worry, Jerrica." And he drags her out onto uh, the balcony, I guess. 
I guess. Just to hang out for a little bit, because he's well, he he says that it's Jem's party and you're doing all the work when that's not true because the orphans are doing all the work. Yeah, and also, um, generally, big parties work where the person you are throwing the party for is not the person <laughs> who is kind of doing the bulk of the labor. <laughs> Who's in charge of it, yeah. Why, why isn't Howard Sands doing more, is my question. Well, he's too rich. Um, and I have a note that says, uh, he says it's Jem's party, and I said, or as Kimber would say, um, it's a Jem and the Holograms party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean, thankfully the banner said Jem and the Holograms and not just Jem. Because, yeah. uh, I mean, Kimber gets set off pretty early in the episode here. I, well, pretty... Kimber gets set off later in the episode, so... Mm -hmm. Kimber's Rebellion Part 2. Kimber's Rebellion Part 2. But uh, Jerrica asks Rio how he's feeling about Jem, so Jerrica needs to stop uh, catfishing Rio on purpose. <laughs> um, and Rio I... needs to stop saying things like, she makes the air sizzle. Yeah, and not only that, he says she makes the air sizzle in like a really a longing tone and he's looking out into the night sky and you could tell he's just like oh Jim and it's like this is directly in front of your girlfriend buddy yeah and um but then he's like well if you could find her unlike you Jerrica you're not like Jim which I have written down you're not like Jim you don't make the air sizzle <laughs> Well, he refers to Jerrica as uh, responsible, dependable, and comfortable to be around or be with. And uh, Jerrica equates that to a pair of old shoes. Yep, and uh, then Rio kisses that pair of old <laughs> shoes wearing lipstick. <laughs> that sweet old leather. Gets his oh, lips yeah. right on it. And, and uh, Just yeah. like his favorite pair of sneakers. <laughs> and, this is li and remember, this is literally two seconds after, you know, confirming that he is in love with Jem as well. Yeah, so it's at this point that I, like, any sympathy that I could have possibly had for Rio, um, it doesn't exist anymore because he is actively working against his own interests. He is. Well, so is Jerrica, to be fair. Oh, yeah, I, who says I can't be not sympathetic for both of them? You're, you're right. The only person that we can be sympathetic for is Jem, who actually, in this whole situation, doesn't really lose anything because it's all technically Jerrica losing everything. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good It's a really in. boring, tough situation. <laughs> And it's a good lead-in to our first song here, Who Is He Kissing, which is uh, incredibly appropriate for the time, which I think we're going to start getting into more uh, appropriate songs for the episode. We're going to end up with a fucking, you know, uh, the, the we're going to get Music is Magic again in the Magic episode, probably, or something like that, you know? Probably. Um, I have the Shangri-La of... song. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I have a couple of notes for um, Who Is He Kissing. One of the first things is that they use the term making love. Yeah, is it, uh, it's, the the lyrics are something along the lines of, who is he kissing, uh, you or me, or is he making love, or is it me, or is he making love to a fantasy, which... No. I, 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 I first believe... of all, I think you would know, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> if he had boned Jem. Well, I think this is, a, it, I mean, the, the theme of the song is it's a gigantic identity crisis. For, uh -huh, yeah, because I was going to say, unless, this doesn't really, I said, like, you know who he's kissing, unless she's <laughs> wondering if he already knows that she is Jem, which he doesn't. Right. That's the. Oh, I mean, you know, I would say, why would Rio hide that? But then, I know that Christy Marx is just like gonna gonna be like, oh, well, yeah, Rio knew all along, even though that never no, happened. Didn't. Yeah. Uh, he was, so, according did to, not. to the Christy Marx headcanon, Rio knew all along. I'll say, and she created the series, or at least you know wrote most of the episodes. So I'll I'll believe her. See, and if he did know all along, that's shitty because he is not helping Jerrica <laughs> by not saying that he knows. Well, I mean, um, I guess he's he's counter fucking with her on purpose because she's fucking with him. You know what? I won't give Rio the benefit of the doubt very often, but that's that's fair. <laughs> Jerrica's not innocent in all of this. Um, one of my notes for this song is Jerrica, you did this to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Also, I want to say immediately that when Jem and Jerrica show up in the same music video, it definitely did not happen. And uh, were Rio's eyes always blue? Did I ask that question before? Oh, God, I feel like you did, and I don't think we came to a conclusion. Because they're blue in this music video, and I don't know. As well as, I'm pretty sure Jerrica's are blue, but I don't know if Jem's are blue. It might just I be I, our, th those I'm big old sure. blues. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lovely visual of uh, Jerrica running down a kiss lips hallway. Like, like I have a, one. A, ki a kissy lips hallway. And there's a lot of gems running around. Rio's wearing a terrible tan suit Sharp. in one of the shots. Very and, sharp. Uh, and yeah, it ends on a, a sparkly teardrop coming from Jerrica. A really thick tear. <laughs> yeah, That's she's, what I uh, noticed. A lot of, lot, of, lot of glucose in those tears. It was gross. Basically jelly coming out of her eye. Uh, yeah, and at the end of the music video, we get to see um, kind of the romance going on. Because they were kissing while all of this was happening. And, yeah, this uh, is all going on in Jerrica's head, i 
Yeah. Um, and we see through a pair of binoculars, veneers that look like binoculars, that uh, the misfits are spying <laughs> from their mansion, which is nearby. Before before we mansion. get to before we get to Pizzazz's mansion, I just wanted I just got a question for you, Kristen. So we know that Kimber writes the hologram songs, mm-hmm. right? So yep. if she wrote that song, is that some kind of like is that her trying to tell Jerrica like, hey, you should probably tell Rio your gem? Do you think does is Rio stupid and he doesn't understand subtext? Of like, I think there might be something going on in this song more once he hears it. Does Rio even think... listen to the Gem of the Hologram songs? Probably not. He's not a supportive boyfriend. <laughs> um, let's see. What I was going to say is, do you think these songs like this are Kimber purposefully negging Jerrica? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. is this her, like, you know, is everybody out there fucking with Jerrica because Jerrica's fucking with them? Yeah. And again, we got to remember now as a, the lead into the Misfits that Jerrica was the first one to fuck with the Misfits. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, Pizzazz is scoping out the party via binoculars and, uh, there's a wonderful shot of Pizzazz just making a horrible, like, pig face, uh, saying <laughs> they're having such a good time. It's disgusting. Yep. She's like the Grinch. Yeah, she's very... <laughs> she doesn't want anybody <laughs> to have fun unless she's involved. Her heart is three sizes too small. Yep, but her ego is 90 sizes too big. Oh, yeah. As we learn in that scene as well. Uh-huh. Um, Roxy and Stormer didn't know Pizzazz was rich, which we had a discussion about this. That must mean that the Misfits all literally just met each other six months ago when they, like, first debuted through Starlight Music. <laughs> when they came in on the guitar motorcycles, and they never hung out with each other either. Yeah. Or, like, talked about themselves. Well, I guess that makes sense, because this won't have anything to do with anything for a while, but it takes until the second season for Pizzazz and Roxy to learn about Stormer's brother. True. A famous drummer. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot about that. Wow. So yeah, I think, no, you know, in that same episode, they find out that her name is Mary. <laughs> like they, they never bothered asking. They only just call her Stormer the entire time. Why? Yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? Um, but yeah, they when they talk about how big her uh, house is, Pizzazz's response is my favorite thing in the universe. She goes, eh, "We have bigger ones." <laughs> yeah, she just very kind of casually. She's like, "Yeah, this isn't our biggest mansion." Like, <laughs> like, yeah, we've been um joking about like how rich pizzazz is this entire time so like you you know me saying oh you know all oh, your house burned down i have five houses <laughs> like I'm, I'm not joking it's true. These, are, these are the kind of things that come out of pizzazz's mouth herself this is the truth mm-hmm. I, I also like how when uh before that line when storm was like wow who knew you had such a big house there's an establishing shot of the mansion to show just how gigantic it is before pizzazz uh-huh. says that they have bigger ones and uh Pizzazz also says that, you know, eh, who cares about money? And we have the wonderful just sort of uh, two-second pause of Roxy and Stormer looking at each other, and then the dual response of, we do. Yeah, because they're both poor, I think. <laughs> at least well, Roxy definitely is. Yeah, Roxy grew up in fucking ghetto-ass Philadelphia, and Pizzazz, I don't even know Stormer's story. Yeah, we don't learn too more, much more about her besides the, the brother thing. But... It was funny because when they do that, when Pizzazz says, who cares about money, um, before Roxy and Stormer say, we do, that's what I was thinking in my head. <laughs> like, I like, do. I care about money. Yeah, I care about money, and then it happens. So it's this, uh, you know, TV show coming right out of my own noggin, basically. Yeah, and uh, Pizzazz says that she has aspirations beyond just money. She wants to be famous. She wants people to throw themselves at her feet. She wants to be a goddess, basically, which explains a lot. I can relate to that. Explains a lot of the imagery in the music videos. Oh, yeah. Especially one that comes up later. And uh, Roxy just has the bright idea. Hey, you know, if I was as rich as you, Pizzazz, I would buy my own movie studio. And, and... Pizzazz is like, oh, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> well, now that you say We could do that. <laughs> and yeah, we have a scene of, uh, we are introduced to, what is it, Harvey? Harvey Gabor, I believe. Oh, God, I don't even remember. Is Pizzazz's dad's name? But uh, yeah, he showed, I only referred to him as Pizzazz's dad in the notes. And I'm pretty sure I only remembered his name just now. But uh, he's a very busy man. He's busy McGee talking on the phone about oil wells and fucking $3 million or something like that. That's and how Pizzazz- you know he's rich. <laughs> and Pizzazz comes in and just kind of, he's like, hey, you know how he said I could get anything I wanted for my birthday. So uh, how about a movie studio? He calls it a poor investment. <laughs> Like, that's how he thinks in terms yeah. of it, this This present for my daughter will be a poor investment. That's how uh, fathers talk to children. Yeah. And uh, Pizzazz starts to, you know, throw a, a tizzy. She gets in a bit of a fit and picks up a model of the Washington Monument and, like, isn't really, like, threateningly swinging it around or anything. She just kind of has it in her hand. She just needs something to get out of all of that uh, anger. All that aggression. And uh, he caves because always she's the little angel. He doesn't and, want his uh, arm broken again. He doesn't. <laughs> 
he doesn't want her, uh, you know, sabotaging the oil fields or anything. Because obviously mm-hmm. she doesn't care about money, so what does she care if they no longer have any more money? Uh-huh, so uh, they end up buying the movie studio that is, I guess, the same studio for the gym movie. Very coincidentally, the same movie studio. Whoa. Can we assume that it's basically, it was the closest movie studio, probably? And, Maybe. And, uh, like, that's why it's the one that Howard Sands owns, and Harvey Gabor is just like, eh, give me that one. And also, uh, Eric Raymond is put in charge, to which uh, Pizzazz says that she knows the perfect man to run the the thing. And I don't think Pizzazz trucks, trusts Eric that much. See, I think what she was actually saying is, I know who we could say is in charge, and then I will um, wrap my hands around his tiny little devil neck <laughs> if he dares cross me. So she actually, really... Pizzazz is in charge. Yeah, she's the, the devil behind the devil. Mm-hmm. So, um, Gem and the Holograms are ready to do their uh, first day on set for the movie, though. And yeah, they arrive, and uh, Howard Sands is there, and he's like, hey, we got a bit of a problem. Uh, you know, the new studio head, he wants to go see ya. And uh, that's when the misfits are in this office, and Eric does a dramatic turnaround in his chair that's like four frames long. <laughs> it, it, it looks very choppy. Mm-hmm. And Eric delivers the line. Well, first, you know, Gem says, I thought you were in jail. And it, Again. It, yeah, and Eric delivers the line again of "It's amazing what lawyers can do if you pay them enough." Yeah. Also, um, when they very the very first time they come in and they see the misfits before they see Eric, I wrote down that I'm pretty sure I heard someone from uh, the crowd that the holograms was in say the misfits. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, really good line reads this episode. Yeah, that just sounds great. But yeah, that happened. Um, and there's another performance clause involved here because the holograms were like, we don't want to do this. We don't want to work with uh, Eric Raymond, which is a reasonable thing to say when confronted with the man who is like literally saying to his face that he is going to make your lives very difficult for the duration of this movie shoot. Uh, yeah. Um, and it turns out there's another fail- for a pro- clause for a failure to fulfill the contract you sign. Like, do, do the holograms read anything they put their names on? <laughs> well, I have a question of basically Eric doesn't say that they have to like pay money or anything he just says if you don't want to work on the movie you can't be on the movie which is basically how a contract works so yeah. unless like did they did he mean that if you don't want to work on the movie i get starlight music like you, you're no forfeiting idea. the battle of the bands technically if that's what he was trying to say uh the dialogue did not convey it properly no, no it did not that would have been a much better thing to go for uh as well as uh Jem pretty much is also you know very angry about this and she says no it's our movie you can't do this when Ah, uh, you know, I, 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 this is this has probably happened in Hollywood before of yeah. somebody, you know, pulling a movie out from under your feet that you were contracted to do. And I think they should just take the L on this one and let the misfits. Like, I, really, all that they're doing here is just the pride of not letting the misfits upstage them. I guess. Yeah, they have nothing to gain because, like, the entire thing that uh, I was like getting from the scene is like, obviously, they don't want to work with the misfits or Eric Raymond, because it's going to be a terrible experience for them. Like, they go into this and they're like, they're going to make us upset and they're going to, like, get under our skin. It's going to be a really bad time. So they're like, no, we don't want to do this. And then once he says, like, you know, pulls out the whole contract thing and tells them, like, oh, we, you know, you signed this thing. Nice job, idiots. They immediately kind of, like, switch gears into saying, um, no, forget that. We will do it. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, we'll do the thing that we were really against doing a minute ago, and this still won't be fun for us. Yeah, it's, I don't know, did they think that they would, like, scare off Eric? Like, ha, you try your worst, Eric. We'll be able to live through it, and they don't know how worst Eric is capable of becoming. Yeah, and um, they also, one of the notes I have is just, um, from like here on out, Eric is screaming all of his lines this entire episode. <laughs> he pretty Well, he has to be a uh, big shot Hollywood man, basically, so. Yeah, he pulls it off. He sounds like he's about to pop. He's, he's, a, he's a dick for the rest of the episode, especially when he becomes the director, which we will talk about uh, oh, yeah. in a second. It is the end of segment one, though. Nobody is in th- nobody's threatened of like like dying, and there's not really intrigue other than the fact that like it ends on the line of basically Eric saying, you know, oh, the Misfits are going to be, you know, big movie stars if they do this movie without even knowing their acting ability or anything, which I believe... Also, what the hell do they care about the success of the Misfits compared to them now that they aren't battling for Starlight Music? That's the thing. The Battle of the Bands is over, so... If the Misfits want to make a movie, let them make the movie. Yeah. It, I think it all just it comes down to principles of we don't want to let these people succeed, which is a very Misfits thing to do. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so Gem and the Holograms turn into the Misfits at the end of segment one here, holding their ground. And uh, I, I have the question also, can't they just, like, can they shop a script to another movie studio? Like, who wouldn't want to make a movie about Gem and the Holograms? 
I'm assuming that there is a whole contract uh, like a, thing uh, like involved a non -compete in this too. clause or something like something. that. Something. Because otherwise, uh, someone would have brought it up. They really, I, I mean, honestly, this episode is jam-packed with shit, so they don't have time to explain all that, probably. Yeah, again, I think we're giving the cartoon just a little bit too much credit. Yeah, and uh, beginning of segment two, uh, we see Aja driving, which thankfully she is driving, so... Yep, things are back as they should be. <laughs> things are doing okay. At peace. We learn that uh, Anthony Julian is directing this movie, which I have the question of, is this just Howard Sands uh, doing favors for his friends? Because Anthony Julian directs music videos. Who knows? <laughs> is he, is this some kind of Adam Sandler gig where he's just, is this is a, a quick and dirty thing that's going to make money at the box office, but it's going to be a terrible movie and everybody gets like a, a, a vacay? Uh, yeah, because banned uh, movies always go so well. I, why, you know, is is the Countess here as the, you know, is she the costume designer for this? Like, everybody's lying in their pockets somehow. Video's making a documentary about this. What's going on? Yeah, and um, speaking of the outfits and everything, I see that you uh, really enjoyed Jem's weird gray NASCAR suit. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was, like, for a scene or something, but she's wearing this, like, gray racing suit with, like, a like a pink section around the midriff for some reason. No, no that's just her outfit today. That's just her outfit today. Like, for, I, I don't know why. Yeah, uh, Gem in a fucking gray racing suit. Jesus, it looks terrible is the exact note. Uh -huh. So, um, but Eric comes over to them and screams at them to go get their makeup done. <laughs> yeah, as you said, screaming his lines for the rest of the episode. Yep, and uh, they're like, uh, Jericho, what's going to happen when a makeup artist touches your hologram? <laughs> Which and, really should have uh, been... Yeah, Jem's response is, I'll think of something, and I was like, uh, maybe she should have thought of something beforehand, because this is a movie. <laughs> like, you couldn't maybe assume that someone was going to get near you during this? Uh, you know, I think, well, that's the thing, she's gonna have a kissing scene, so what happens then? Well, they don't bring it up again, so apparently nothing. Yeah, I guess it's only it's only a means to make the makeup people angry at Jem, because before they go into the makeup room, the misfits kind of cut them off, and all, you know give insults to them about age before beauty and shit like that. And yep, uh, they have to hold Aja back because she's ready to kill someone <laughs> Dude, well, well, over makeup. At least it's not Kimber. Yep. Aja wants part of the action too. Um, but yeah, the misfits in sequence uh, have their sick burns <laughs> come to uh, the makeup room and close the door. And uh, while they are in there, Pizzazz takes that opportunity to talk shit about Jem. Yeah. She gives uh she tells them that, Oh, you know, uh, Jem's such a prima donna, you know, you're going to hate working with her basically. Mm -hmm. Later, there's a fade. The holograms are still waiting outside. The misfits come out, and they have more sick birds in sequence, <laughs> which I guess they uh, decided on before uh, they left the room. Yeah, in perfect order, too. It's got to be Pizzazz, Roxy, and Stormer in that order. Just yep. so, and it's not even like you think they would do it the opposite way, so that uh, Pizzazz could have the sickest burn and get the last laugh. But it's always Stormer. Yep. Do you think that would create, like, a personal conflict in Pizzazz? She always wants to be first, but she, she knows that last has the most impact. Oh, I'm sure that um, she thinks that um, next to her, it doesn't matter what um, order she's in, hers uh, will always stick the longest. She probably doesn't so even hear So she gets hear... to go first, and she also gets the last word. <laughs> she probably doesn't even notice that Roxy and Stormer are speaking. It's probably just she says her thing, and then Roxy White follows noise. her lead. Yeah. She says her thing, and then she's too busy congratulating herself to hear her, her bandmates also yep, give sick burns. High-fiving in her head. Yeah, so they go in, and Jem's solution to the problem of not being able to get touched by a makeup artist is, uh, I gotta do my own makeup. Yeah, and if she thought of a better excuse earlier, then uh, she wouldn't have offended the makeup artist, because that's a really shitty thing to say to a professional. Yeah, that is true. That is, and I'm better at your job <laughs> than you are, so <laughs> I'm going to do my own makeup. And unsurprisingly, the makeup artist is like, oh man, she is really stuck up. Yeah, and I, it's you kind of feel bad for Gem and the Holograms by the end of the episode for how the crew feels about them, but it's definitely partially deserved. Because mm -hmm. they don't know. They don't know the circumstances, but it definitely, t on the on the surface, it looks like Gem and the Holograms are being complete assholes. Yeah, they didn't think of a better way to handle that situation. Uh, but they finish eventually, uh, get back to where filming is about to start. and uh, have a little team meeting. Uh-huh. Uh, Jeff finally shows up, Kimber boyfriend number one. Uh, yeah, Jeff Jeff Wright, the stuntman. Also, there's an out-of-my-way motif in the background when Pizzazz is talking about whatever. She doesn't say anything important. I just wanted to make sure that I put the the fact that the out-of-my-way motif plays. Good, but uh, yeah, uh, Pizzazz is talking about how her dad owns the studio and asks for someone to get her a chair. So they grab the chair that Kimber is going to sit in, and instead of falling out to the ground, <laughs> uh, Jeff, the stuntman, yep, uh, catches her. Catches her, and there's a really tight close-up on his face, and it made me uncomfortable. <laughs> 
I want to talk more about the guy who runs in from the left side of the screen and grabs the chair from where Kimber is about to sit because he is like fucking lightning getting that out of there. Oh, yeah. He should be the stunt man. (laughs) And uh, yeah, Jeff introduces himself to Kimber and Kimber's a complete bitch and just looks like, oh, Nick Mann, big actor guy. With a great name. With a great name, Nick Mann. Which I don't uh, know if, is that actually, I know she says Nick Mann and they refer to him as Nick, but is like, is just, is Nick Mann his name? I guess so. That's just how I referred to him. It's, um, well, it's spelled with two N's. Yeah, that's his last last name. name. That's what Uh I assumed anyway. Um, and, uh, but Nick is Mackinon Gem, because she's the leading lady, and, uh, he's schmoozing her talking about how, uh, he always falls in love with, uh, his leading ladies. Which is gross. Yeah, it's creepy. Um, he's not being very professional, so I'm surprised he is, well, yeah, mm, mm, considering <laughs> what I heard about Hollywood sexism, perhaps I'm not actually that surprised. <laughs> it's probably uh, even, like, way more rampant in the 80s, too, so... Oh, yeah. Um, so Kimber um, makes a failed attempt to get Nick's attention, and uh, he insists that he and Jem actually just go up to a quiet corner over yeah, there. Yeah, that's the. Well, okay, so here's the order of things that are happening Pizzazz is indirectly an asshole to Kimber, uh, mm-hmm. Kimber is an asshole to Jeff. Roxy comes in to try and schmooze Jeff. Jeff is an asshole to Roxy by saying <laughs> that he would rather fall off a building than talk to her, basically. <laughs> uh, yep. Uh,. Nick is an asshole to Jem. Nick is also an asshole to Kimber. And, and I believe Kimber's that's... an asshole to Jeff again, because Jeff comes and he said, nah, I told you he's, he wouldn't be interested. <laughs> and Kimber goes, who asked you? And, and uh, uh, I have, I've written down, yeah, burn him to the ground, Kimber. <laughs> but yeah, it's this, this, it's this extended sequence of people being assholes to each other that ends with, yeah, I believe either that thing or Nick telling Jem that they're going to go off into a corner to uh, rehearse their love scene. Ew. Which, yeah, I, ick is one of the, like, I don't understand, like, I, like, I get that maybe they couldn't say scene where they kiss or something, even though there was a song called Who Are They Kissing? Or Who Is He Kissing? Like, love scene is definitely not the correct way to refer to it, because then it makes it sounds like they're gonna have sex. Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe they're off getting theirs or something, because we cut away, and, uh, there is, uh, a horrible monster driving a car, (laughs) (laughs) and its name is Clash. Yeah, uh, uh, the the fucking Muppet that plays the drums pulls up. Oh, wait, it's Clash. Yeah, I, I really like Clash, but her hair looks so bad. No, oh it is uh, green and pink, like striped almost. Like, and she has a like, rat tail. Squiggly. <laughs> and she has a rat tail. And she's wearing like a, like, a, like a pukey yellow fur, kind of. Yeah, and she manages to get in because she's like at the security thing and she says, oh, you have a pass for uh, Miss Montgomery, which is her last name. Which is correct, because be yeah, she is Montgomery. Right, she's Constance Montgomery, a.k.a. Clash, a.k.a. a monster. A.k.a. Video's cousin. Uh-huh, so um, the security guard tries to, like, give her directions, and she speeds away um, instead. And uh, then Video pulls up behind her, and she's like, I- I'm Vivian Montgomery, you should have a pass for me, and the security guard goes, Duh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the old, uh, the classic of, like, Duh, she just came through! Uh huh. So he lets video in anyway, I guess, because you know, look at those bars in her makeup. She looks like a video person. <laughs> yeah. Hey, why not? That's how. She, that's how she. That's how you know. Mm hmm. So, um, Clash gets in, and it turns out she is a huge fan of the Misfits. <laughs> yeah, which is why I guess they call her in the toy commercial the fourth Misfit, even though she's not. Nope. And... Pizzazz would never allow that. Yeah. No. She she lives to suck up to Pizzazz, basically. Mm hmm. And uh, she she goes, hey, watch this. And uh, she clangs her, like, cymbal bracelets together uh, in front of Jem, which does nothing other than make Jem go, ah, what the fuck? And Anthony Julian is ready to kick her ass because of this. Oh, yeah. He's like, I'm going to kill that little high schooler. <laughs> uh, again, I have another note. Eric cannot stop screaming. Because, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> Eric and Anthony Julian are screaming at each other. And Anthony Julian quits. So, uh, back to the sh- videos. I wrote down, I am shocked that their argument didn't go to fisticuffs. Like, they looked like they were ready to kill each other. I, I the, People had to hold Anthony back. That's, I mean, maybe he really hates symbols. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And um, in whatever is going to happen before the next song, when they're back at Star- Starlight Mansion, I guess? Yeah. Um, there's a, like, panning shot of um, the room that they're all in, and uh, Kimber's hanging out on the bed. And I can tell it's Kimber because she has her pink monster outfit on, um, and her hair is gem color pink. <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, and then when wearing... it cuts back to her again, it's um, it's regular Kimber pink. Well, you gotta love those coloring errors. In addition to oh, yeah. wearing her triangle jacket yep, and, her, and, and her beret. Yep, got to Yes, of course, mm -hmm. the, the the perfect thing. Everybody's wearing those styles then, because Jem is in the Jackie O outfit for something uh -huh. this episode. She it was I don't think it was at the party, but it was. Maybe for this music video, she's in the Jackie O outfit. I don't remember. But yeah, uh, Mrs. Bailey it just basically comes over and says, uh, hey, uh, you know, we're going to set Bonnie up for her eye doctor appointment pretty soon. Just, uh, you know, be ready for that. Just kind of the, the, the B story making its appearance again. She's like, hey, I'm still here. Don't worry about the movie. Yep. Uh, and then we move into our second song, which is Jealousy. Yeah, they're, they're filming this scene. This is a scene in the movie, I believe. Because most of it happens in reality, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure. I mean, there's we'll see in Universal Appeal, the third song, things that it definitely happened, but there's visuals that make it seem like it isn't happening, obviously. Yeah, that's pretty common. Um, I, one of the things, this is basically Nick versus Rio for Jem, uh, who is not Rio's girlfriend. <laughs> and um, this is, I, I have written down, this is basically the song from earlier, Who Is He Kissing, but from Rio's perspective instead. Pretty much, yeah. It's uh, And there's a lot of fun stuff with... Uh, red lights on Rio's face and fire, and like yeah, everything's on fire like in this music video. Uh, Asha's wearing workout gear in this one. She's got the headband and the fucking uh, shirt with the with the various geometric shapes on it. Sure, I like that Rio's <laughs> in pain in uh, this music video. Yeah, basically, um, it looks uh, like there's a lot of fire going on. So I wrote down, "Oh, I get it. This is the burning bed." Oh yeah, this is when it's happening. Even though it's uh -huh. Nick, Nick Man is the one uh, perpetuating it instead of. Rio cheating on Jericho with herself. It's Nick Man stealing Jericho or Gem away. Yeah, the end result is that something is on fire, so. Yeah. Well, yeah, I have definitely written here, uh, revenge, revenge, revenge is one of the lines. I forget what it leads into, but uh, this music. Yeah, it's like revenge, revenge, <laughs> revenge is, what, is, is all that's on your mind or yeah. something. And uh, um, <laughs> I, I like the song. It's pretty short, though. Yeah, and the music video seems to be suggesting that Rio is going to kill Nick Man. Basically. Uh, well, and he does punch him, so I guess that's why the fisticuffs didn't happen earlier, because yeah. they needed to save them for a Rio <laughs> clocking Nick Man in the fucking face. Which was not supposed to happen, apparently. Yeah, no. Um, I would also like to point out, everyone else is in costume during this. Rio's in his schlumpy regular life man clothes. <laughs> the Countess took one look at him and went, no, just no, go, no, just go no, on to the set. Oh, the pink shirt and the gray jacket. No, you are perfect. <laughs> And that was sarcastic, just, but you couldn't tell because it was in oh, a French accent. Gonna... She actually wanted him to change. <laughs> but uh, he was but just he like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm hot. <laughs> I make the air sizzle. And, uh, yeah, I I don't understand why that wasn't part of the movie. Like, I assume that, I, I mean, maybe just the, the punching maybe he seems was supposed to, to happen later. Punch him. Yeah, <laughs> but he actually punched him. He's never been trained. How, are you, how do you suspect he's going to fake punch a guy? Yeah, and... I can't remember. I'm one thing I wrote down how much Nick shows up after the, this movie stuff. I don't, I don't think, he, think does. he does at all. Yeah. Good. I know Jeff he... at least has one or two other appearances. No, Jeff's I around think. for a while. Is he? I don't even remember. Yeah, but whatever. He's Kimber boyfriend number one. Yeah. And, uh, yep, so here is where I guess they're going to have a little meeting about, a, a, like, a press meeting. So there's all these uh, reporters waiting outside and uh, with Lindsay Pierce among them, and she looks completely different now. Yeah, I think she's wearing, what, one of her default outfits. I feel like we definitely see this one a couple of times. It's yeah. slightly better. She's still got the weird 80s headband on, which I don't appreciate, but... Yeah, and her hair's all curly, and yeah, it's just, it, it looks like workout gear again. Uh-huh, uh, Pizzazz is dressed as a clown lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's got a very, she's got a pukey green dress with polka dots on it, and uh, black and pink, uh, what is the name of that? The the neck thing? Uh, a neck ruffle. A neck ruffle. I don't know okay. what I can't remember. I took history of costume when I was a sophomore. <laughs> but yeah, she looks like either a, a Victorian kind of fucking person or a clown wearing clown that. Clown lady. Yeah. Uh, Roxy has her hair seaweed. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they're all just gonna, everybody's being let in to ask questions about the movie. And I have the question, uh, why is Lindsay here when she's just an MTV VJ? Um, because music television. Do they send the VJs on missions in the 80s? Do you, I, I, don't I, don't know why know. I, I don't know why I ask you all the questions about MTV as if you watched it. Yeah, I, n especially not in the 80s when I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> so one of the notes that I have is uh, during all these awkward, th this awkward interview with the questions and everything, poor Jem is it? Like, I, I feel bad for her in the scene because she's trying her best not to be like, Nick Man's a piece of shit. Keep him away yeah. from me. Please, he's touching me, my shoulder. Get off my shoulder. Don't touch my shoulder. <laughs> um, she says uh, very a bunch of times, except she doesn't say very. She says very. I, yeah, I noticed that as well. It's like she says it multiple times, and it's very strange. It's very strange. 
very strange. Um, and the um people who are trying to interview them for the press conference go from uh like zero to eighty with their questions from romance to love affair to wedding. <laughs> I have I have a problem with with the term love affair being used because uh, I mean you, that acts uh, as if they know anything about Jim's personal life in the first place. Yeah, that too. And I assume they they just mean like, oh, is there love in the air? I guess. I guess so. They the terminology has been all fucked up this entire episode. Yeah, this is very this is a very sexual leaning sort of episode for some reason. Yeah, so oh, I guess they had to make it edgy because it's the first episode after <laughs> the uh, the pilot episode. <laughs> well, a five year old girl heard the phrase "making love." Time to buy the doll. Holy shit. Um, but yeah, Kimber, uh, you know, not really surprisingly gets uh, irritated by all of this and storms off. And uh, Eric's like, oh, where are you going? And Kimber's like, they don't even know I exist. Rebellion part two. <laughs> well, I was going to say that she was jealous because of all the attention Jem is getting. But then I realized like just now that it's because uh, Nick Man is, uh, is all kissing on Jem and she wants Nick Man to be kissing on her, basically. Yeah. Which, like, I don't totally blame her, even if Nick Man is a piece of shit, because uh, Kimber can look at that situation and go, Jem, stop letting Nick Man kiss on you. You already have a boyfriend. That too, but she doesn't say that or anything, so. No. It's like, you know, Jem's getting all this cake and eating it too. Um, but yeah, Eric starts schmoozing Kimber again, and Kimber, for some reason, does not see through this in an instant. <laughs> like, she hasn't learned her lesson when it like, comes to Eric Raymond. Like, this didn't happen once before already. Yeah, like, it, it, he starts offering her things, like, some sort of like, terrible, mythical creature, like a genie that has all these caveats. <laughs> where it's well, like, oh, would you like a scene with Nick Man? You have to kill Jem. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, well, I honestly, if I were Kimber, I think in that situation, and I wanted to kiss on Nick Man as much as she did, I'd, I'd probably do it. Yeah, but um, and then it like cuts over to the misfits, and Rio is over there, and Pizzazz is hanging off of him like a jacket. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Rio again, even though Jem is not his girlfriend, is getting a little bit irritated by the Nick Man stuff. So um, the misfits are all like, "Oh, just wait a second. and they pull some well, Roxy and Stormer pull some sort of rope to why bring would down Pizzazz a... do that work. Yeah, they bring down the banner, and I think the banner says the Misfits in Starbright featuring yeah. Gem and the Holograms yeah, also, written very small. Yeah, also with Gem and the Holograms, which is apparently news to everyone, even though this yeah. is on the third day of filming. Because they also ask a question about the fact that Anthony Julian quit. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's they're like, wait a minute, the Misfits? I thought this was a Gem movie. Yeah, so there's a little bit of chatter about that. Honestly, they it is not really the big power move that they kind of make it out to be. It was a little bit lackluster, in yeah, my it felt, opinion. Yeah, it felt kind of flat. Um, uh, Jem is kind of irritated anyway, and Rio is like, I didn't know it was going to happen, I swear. And uh, Jem goes, uh, yeah, right, whatever. I'm like, I don't like Rio either, but that doesn't make any sense. I don't yeah, know where I, she's directing her anger. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I have written here that everyone's pissed at everyone else because I guess because Rio was standing in close proximity to the Misfits, he had something to do with this giant banner that is making people more angry than it should. Uh, as well as the fact that uh, Pizzazz comes over and she tells all these people that her father owns... Th the movie studio, which I feel like is a bad idea because you're basically giving them full clout to run the story about like about nepotism, pretty much. Yeah. Um. And at some point, I believe it's Roxy says that uh, like, oh, you are you? They're like, oh, are you gonna play music in uh the the movie? And uh, she's like, oh, it wouldn't be a film without our music, which means no other films existed until now. <laughs> Well, how would we know? Because uh, I have a question about Roxy, which I forgot to bring up before. Uh, Roxy's illiterate, which is something that comes up in <laughs> in like 30 episodes, pretty much. Yep. But uh, how did she read the script? Because that's the other thing. They find out that she's illiterate in that episode. So uh, No, they don't. I'm pretty sure at least Stormer. So Stormer was being a good person, helping her out, probably. Stormer was probably reading her. it to her. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I yeah, definitely I... remember it was a sticking point because Pizzazz finds out and laughs the shit out of her. But, you know, we'll get to that. I just want to know, like, how I want to try <laughs> I want to yeah, try and keep not... continuity for an 80s cartoon <laughs> that shouldn't have continuity. I know, absolutely. Because yeah, I feel like at some point when it eventually does get brought up uh, 500 episodes from now, Stormer is the one who kind of leans over and says, like, oh, you know, we're doing this uh, reading on live TV. Shouldn't you let them know that you can't read? <laughs> and Roxy's like, no, fuck it. We're we're doing it live. <laughs> that's that's a typical reference. Yeah, that's wow, that's timely. And uh, so yeah, we get a scene now where Howard Sands is uh, going to uh, Harvey Gabor's uh, Gabor Mansion, which is it, it's ba I feel like it's basically modeled after Trump Tower because yeah, it says like, Gabor across it. Uh huh. Um, I don't think that uh, Harvey Gabor and Pizzazz are um good allegories a, for Donald Trump. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> they're not. They're bad people. They're not that bad. <laughs> 
And uh, yeah, it's Howard Sands is trying to plead his case that Eric Raymond's going to ruin the gem movie, and Harvey Gabor doesn't care because uh, he just doesn't want to deal with Pizazz's shit any more than anyone else. Which is fair, you know what? He is the money that he can actually uh, have a defense <laughs> against Pizazz coming at him with tiny models of the Washington Monument. So, uh, as mean as that is for a father to say about his daughter, um, I feel him a little bit. No, I feel him too. You're right. Uh-huh. It's I, I understand his pain, especially yeah, when it comes to something like this where he can get her away for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I wrote down like if my if it makes my daughter happy and keeps her out of my hair, blah blah blah. And then uh, in a little bit, he becomes Kimber Sugar Daddy, which <laughs> we'll talk about when we get to that episode. I don't even is that the is that the ski lodge episode? I don't even remember. No, that's the um the Father's, Father's Day, Day episode. Father's Day episode. Uh-huh. Wow, that's that a one's wild. one of my favorites. Yeah, uh, I cannot wait to talk about the bullshit that is that episode. <laughs> So we get back to the studio now where the Misfits are about to uh, is film their Is it time for Universal song. Appeal? It is time for Universal Appeal. I just wanted to make sure, again, that uh, Winning is Everything motif plays. Nice. Uh, just wanted to put that in there. And, uh, yeah, we get the Misfits song in the movie, which is Universal Appeal, which we are going to play for you right now. Universal Appeal is probably maybe our favorite song in the entire series. It's very good. I I know that uh, She's Got the Power I claimed was uh, one of my favorites last episode, but Universal Appeal is like twice as good as She's Got the Power, so... Yeah, there's a reason we picked this one, because we also really like Jealousy. Yeah, I feel bad. Like, I have written here, Jealousy was going to be the song, but uh, fuck that. Universal Appeal is great. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love Pizzazz's weird blue stewardess jumpsuit. (laughs) I like it too. It's uh, definitely one of my favorite pizzazz outfits. I um, have a note where it's like um, Roxy's also wearing like a, a similar blue outfit, and Stromer has something purple on. So like, I guess they <laughs> forgot to give her one. The Countess uh, is deliberately giving the Misfits mismatching outfits. Yeah, well, it fits their brand, so jokes on her. Yeah, true. Oh, those Misfits. Yeah, um, Pizzazz's face is on the moon. And yeah, Jerrica's the sun, which we get uh, during the lyric of, you know, the moon's overtaking the sun. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. They're a little bit creepy. I'm not sure. Um, a decent amount of the, like, uh, visuals in this music video are pretty good. The moon and the sun with faces are a little bit creepy. I think it, it might be an Uncanny Valley kind of thing. I also like yeah. that uh, immediately after the uh, the eclipse happens, the air quotes eclipse, uh, the pizzazz moon face turns towards, like, the lower half of the screen and shoots a black laser out of one of her eyes. Not both, just one. And it blows up a star that the holograms are on. Well, to be fair, they don't like to get into this very often, but um, one of Pizzazz's eyes is made out of glass. (laughs) That can shoot lasers. See, it's uh, common in this universe for you to trip them for when your eyes to pop out. Happened to Pizzazz, happened to Bonnie. (laughs) Except both of her eyes popped out. Yeah. It's twice as bad. And, uh, yeah, we have Pizzazz is a giant test for the entirety of this music video, basically. Yep, um, uh, very small holograms are revolving around her. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to I Am a Giant yet, which is, I believe, another thing where Pizzazz is literally a giant for the entire music video. Of course. <laughs> she knows what she likes. And she's spending the entire song fucking up space, like kicking yep. galaxies around and shit like she's fucking Tengen Tapa Gurren Lagan, just fucking <laughs> throwing galaxies around. Every so often, uh, Roxy and Stormer slide in from opposite sides of the screen to go, Universal Appeal! Yep, that's fun. Uh, there's the lyric, In my own mind's eye, I am the sky, so why should I be shy? And when she sings that part, they're all constellations. 
<laughs> that too, as well as uh, the, I believe that's the perfect pizzazz line because that's probably the truest words that she, in her mind, the truest words she's ever spoken. Oh yeah, absolutely. I this song is just great. Very on message. It's very great. It's very uh, misfits, and it happened in real life. Other than those uh, images, which I am going to assume is just it's pizzazz's delusions of grandeur like coming to life, pretty much. Yeah. I believe that. I believe in the power of Pizzazz's uh, wanting things to all revolve around her and how fantastic she is, outclassing um, my argument about whether or not holograms are an excuse <laughs> for all the weird shit that happens in the music videos. I, I'll agree with that. Pizzazz's imagination is more powerful. Pizzazz's need, Pizzazz's mm-hmm. wanting greed is more powerful than holograms. Yeah, she could uh, project 600 million Pizzazz holograms <laughs> per second, minute. And make herself gigantic. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's just her regular power. When, you, when you're rich, you can do a lot of stuff. Yeah. So the song ends, and I guess Jem is... Why did Jem get pissed all of a sudden? I don't remember. <sighs> She's mad because it's their movie. I guess, yeah, she doesn't really have a good reason, I don't think. Otherwise, I probably would have written it down. And But she like storms onto the stage. She's probably jealous that Universal Appeal was such a good song. Probably. So, uh, so Pazez throws a prop star at Jem, and uh, Jem throws it right back. Uh, quipping yeah, she, that she decides Pizazz she's, is a falling star. She is going bring herself down to the level of physical violence, <laughs> which I think is not a great decision because they were probably waiting for that to happen. Um, and it knocks into Pizazz from behind, and uh, everyone's like, oh, "I think Eric is like you attacked Pizazz." <laughs> Even though Jem got hit with the star first. Eh. Uh, also, yeah, this is, I mean, it's its probably apt that it came to physical violence, because this is when they quit. They yeah. are so angry, and uh, you hear the crew kind of chit-chatting, shit-talking, going, oh, oh, prima donnas, they'll be back. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, when you see uh, Gem and the Holograms all standing together, I really like their star-themed outfits. <laughs> I do too, yeah. They're really wanted... coordinated very nicely. Oh my god, do you think Universal Appeal was supposed to be their song? Oh, maybe they were... or maybe they had, they had a, a nicer song that did not... Include lyrics like in my mind's eye. I, I, I am the sky. sky. So I, <laughs> I am the sky. Yeah. So, but yeah, I definitely like their star themed outfits, and I don't know if we ever see them again. So that makes me sad that it was for this music video that never happened, mm-hmm. I guess. Oh my god, I have, I have another important thing I want to note. Uh, Roxy's outfit was the same blue as Pizzazz's, and now it's a weird red outfit that looks nothing like what <laughs> she was wearing in the music video. And it's not like a thing with everyone where it was just for the music video that she was wearing this because Stormer has the same outfit that she was wearing during the music video and Pizzazz's <laughs> outfit hasn't changed. And when the Misfits uh, are finally like celebrating because um, the holograms are leaving, uh, Eric tries to get Kimber to stay and Kimber says no. So once again, Kimber's rebellion was very short. Yeah, it didn't last very long. Was she? Could we say that it was longer than the first one? Like she was in rebellion phase until that moment where she turned down Eric? Uh, I guess so, maybe. Which means that it lasted again. almost 24 hours, probably, because they went home at one point. Yeah, but it, I guess it doesn't really count unless it's happening on camera, right? True. Yeah, you're right. And, uh, yeah, uh, the Misfits are celebrating that uh, Gem and the Holograms quit by J- Pizzazz just screeching that she finally won. Mm-hmm. There, um, there... Video leaves with Gem. Yeah, there's a little scene with uh, Video leaving as well, but because she doesn't want to film the Misfits. And she says, uh, meeting you wasn't a waste of time, which uh, makes it sound like Video is in love with Jem. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Well, Chris yeah. Clash is in love with Pizzazz. Let's just be... That's true. Let's lay the cards on the table. Parallels. Parallels. They're cousins, even though I thought they were sisters. Uh, Clash and uh, Stormer start chanting, the misfits are it. Yes. Yes, they do. And they're uh-huh. jumping around, and Clash is slamming her goddamn symbols together. And yeah, and like I said, uh, Pizzazz is screeching, I finally won. And then we move to uh, the wonderful scene of Bonnie, very clearly, eyes are fucked, uh, Mm -hmm. done with her appointment. When, uh, before they go through this uh, scene where, because Bonnie is a little girl, uh, he, uh, the doctor actually wants to talk to Jerrica about her eyes, but one of the notes that I took was uh, doctor's voice, Bonnie, you're fucking blind. Which uh, is probably not how a doctor should talk to a little girl, so it's probably a, a good thing. Yeah, probably good that you're not that doctor. You're yeah, not that um, o- ophthalmologist. Ophthalmologist. Turns out she has, Bonnie has like a degenerative eye condition that was probably inherited from her parents. And now I'm wondering, because I don't remember them. They talk about Bonnie's parents later, and I don't remember that ever coming up ever again. <laughs> and we know at least one of her parents definitely isn't blind. <laughs> 
That must have been her mom. Whatever. Maybe they never talk about it. But yeah, the doctor says there's nothing her parents could have done for her. Right. and Which uh, is a weird line. The, the, the weird thing about this episode is we don't really end with a solution to the problem either. It's just in a few weeks or even days, or excuse me, in a few months or even weeks. I don't think he said days. Yeah. That, that would that be best. alarming. Holy shit. <laughs> uh, Bonnie will go blind and we end with uh, Jerrica, like her hands on her cheeks looking incredibly shocked like somebody just died. Yeah, I um put in my notes a colon and then a capital O, and that's the <laughs> face that she's making. That is basically that exact face that she is making. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, get... my, my final note for this episode is, uh, yeah, your movie problems don't seem so bad now, do they, Jerrica? <laughs> to be continued, Blind Orphan is yep. my final note. And yeah, the to be continued is going across her face, and that was it. That was part one of Star Bright. And uh, I mean, there's some pretty good cliffhangers for the next episode. You got, you know, obviously we were just talking about Bonnie's eyes, the Misfits winning uh, we didn't really get much out of Nick Mann and uh, Jeff Stuntman, nope. which, what is Jeff's proper last name, right? I'm just going to call him Jeff Stuntman. I don't think it matters. Yeah, he, he only is ever really referred to as Jeff. We'll talk Comma about him more when he shows up again, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's there's a lot of, there was way too much shit going on this episode with people using each other for like power plays. We introduced four named characters. That is true. Yeah, we did. We inter- there are a lot of new characters introduced. Not just, and we're not just talking no, about five, like video Pizazz's clash. Possesses dad, uh, Nick, Jeff, the lady who fucking hangs out at Starlight Mansion was in this episode a lot. Damn. No, z- no zipper and uh, oh. not just no zipper. Uh, there's somebody <gasps> else that was. Mi- oh no, no Ashley. No wonder. We, oh yeah, we were not true. great. We <laughs> Bonnie was too busy taking up taking up the spot. Ashley's we finally in the hospital from her near death experience. Bonnie has been around, but they never really talked about her. I'm going to say, did they name her? No, because I know that she showed up. We talked about how she was, she showed, yeah, she showed up and getting down to business. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> but yeah, we had, uh, you know, we had, Pizazz was using her dad. She was using uh, Eric as like a power play. She was using Rio as a power uh-huh. play in a few situations. Uh, she was using Clash, definitely. Yep. Uh, Eric was using the fact that he owned the studio as leverage against the holograms. Uh, he was trying to turn Kimber Kimber against the holograms. Nick Man was using Gem to, and not necessarily using. Well, yeah, he's using Gem to further his image, yeah. basically. Yeah. And uh, Pizzazz made the the crew think that Gem was a bitch. It's all over the place. Yeah, a, a lot happened in this episode. That's the reason why we had so much to talk about this week. Yeah. Well, it's all over now, and uh, now's the time of the evening where we will tell you about the various ways to contact us and other such things. Uh, you could follow us on the Twitter machine at. C W T A pod. You can follow me at Octopus A W K T A P U S. You can follow me on Twitter at Funny Girl T M, like trademark. You can find us on. We're definitely on iTunes. Uh, we're uh-huh. definitely on SoundCloud. Uh-huh. Mm, still don't know about Stitcher Radio yet. It's still going. Uh, leave a rating. Give a review. Do whatever you feel like. You know. You can reach us on Gmail. Like, comment, subscribe. Like, comment, subscribe. You can reach us on Gmail if you want. CWTAPod at gmail.com. You can tell us about, you know, blind orphans or uh, two-toned hair cousins that you have that have symbol bracelets. Or I mean, your we own, all have one. Or your own failed movie projects. And yeah, we all have a clash in our family. Uh-huh. There's a reason she's called Clash, because she represents the infighting within family. It's deep. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's how Christine Marks <laughs> wanted it. Uh-huh. That's, that was definitely her intention. But uh, yeah, it's all downhill from here, right? Because part two of trilogies, I mean, they tend to be... The next one's going to be The Empire Strikes Back, right? Like, you know, all the holograms are going to die. Bonnie's eyes are going to fall out, like we said. Uh-huh. Uh, Eric Raymond's going to cut off Jem's hand, probably. And then she'll have a matching hook hand to go with Rio's. <laughs> and they can hold hooks. Oh, hook and love. Aw. And then open. she can definitely prove that she's not Jem, because then she can just have a hologram hand. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. There we go. It's going to be great. And it's going to be uh, Starbright Part 2, Colliding Stars. That's the next time we will be together on Can We Talk About Gem and the Holograms. Uh, I'm Joe. I am Kristen. I realize we never haven't really done sign-offs before we end, but uh, there we go. There's a sign-off for you. Join us next time where we will talk about more Gem. Bye-bye.